When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end. Of a stone, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of the night. Three Melanie Shaw, three Melanie Shaw. Welcome to the story of Melanie Shaw. Melanie was born in October 1970 and was placed in a foster care at a young age. She grew up in Kirkby in Ashfield and from the 1981 to 1987 she was at Ashfield Comprehensive School in the town. And then when she was 16 she was sent to Beechwood Children's Home and she stayed there for around a year. When she left, she did overcome drug problems and started doing voluntary work. In an interview broadcast in 2015, she described how she was a full-time mother for 24 years before she decided to speak out about what happened at the children's home. In 2010, she went to the police to report what had happened to her at Beechwood and was one of the first people to do so. In this uh, little film that I've um, put on, it will show you an interview with Jimmy the Hat, uh, Glenn, Glenn Saffa and Marty. And we will also be showing you clips of, of course, Melanie Shaw. So enjoy the show, guys. Well, I'm ashamed to tell the truth. I'm not ashamed of the people of Nottingham, it's just some of the corrupt people that are running this city, and there is a lot of them. It's not just inst institutional child abuse, it's taking properties from people. It's talking about corruption and where the money's going for the taxpayers. There's a lot of dirty shit going down in this city, to be taking fair. Taking children from people. Yeah, state stealing the children, to be fair. Right, all I can say is, this is not about, in my opinion, this is not about any individual. This is about what's going down in this city and it's not a good thing. What bothers me and affects me is institutional child abuse and Operation Daybreak. Specifically Helen Chamberlain, Mom. 
We've had an investigation running now for four years in this city. We've not arrested or charged anybody with anything. Can you stand corrected on that? There's two ways to go. Oh, there trial. is now. There's two yeah. ways to go for trial. I do you know about them, Mickey, to be fair. But what we're going to do is, all the people we didn't arrest and charge, we're now going to relook at them. So everybody who's suffering, all the victims, all the survivors, I'd, I'd rather call them survivors yeah, than victims, well, to be fair. Well, yeah. Right? We now can't settle up because uh, QC Godsmark has decided, while there's a criminal investigation going on, nobody. There's not going to be no court hearings for damages unless we buy you off for about five grand because this is going on and on and on and there's a lot of very, very affected bad people, the victims, survivors that have got drug issues that aren't getting the support in the city and like it's going on and it's never ending to be fair, right? But do you know what I say? I don't, I'm not bothered about the money. It's not about the money, it's about change. Do you know what I mean? Recognition for the suffering. And what pisses me off the most is, to be fair, everybody knew what was happening at Beechwood. There was a serial killer there, right? The children knew, the staff knew, the other social workers knew, the field social workers, the residential ones, all the other children's homes, the teachers. It was all delisted by Jack Straw. You're not allowed to report sexual abuse while you're in care, right? Until you leave when you're 18, and I'll tell you why. Say you've been sexually abused by a family member, and we want to steal your child, right? We'll put them into care, because we're the authorities. We'll look after them. Now, I pathetically say you've been raped, molested, abused in care. We're not going to pay for your legal fees, the social worker's legal fees. Have a court case while you're in care. The council will be found negligent for neglect. They get fined, the child will be awarded damages, but then we'll send the child back to care. Do you know what I mean? Where else is there to go apart from care? And there's something goes seriously wrong. John Mann MP, I emailed you, Gloria DePiro, Equalities Minister. I contacted loads of you. None of you responded, Maria Miller, Margaret Hodge. I, I, wrote to, I wrote to David Cameron. A lot of people have emailed these people in London and the bigger picture is the National Child Abuse Inquiry that has been set to last until 2020. They're brought in Goddard now from Australia. New Zealand. New Zealand. Sorry, I'm not going to talk. What does it matter? Pardon? New Zealand and what does it matter where they well, come from? Well, that's part of the crown, isn't it? You know, but still. Yeah. But what I think is this. It's an inquiry. It's not a criminal investigation. And what happens at an inquiry? They sit down, they have a chat, nothing happens. Just like Lord they Green. They you under the carpet. Well, yeah. There's like, I mean, I don't want to go off on a tangent, right? But I mean, Lord Green, he was the head of the HSBC in the Bank of Bermuda. HSBC. They was taking money from... No, not Mexico. Colombia. You know, you know, trafficking the money for the Good. drugs. Yeah. They had an inquiry. They made £7 million, pound. they charged them £1.3 billion and they let them keep the with f***ing £5.7 billion. This girl's in HMP Peterborough today, alleged to have sold two bags of f***ing heroin, they're in jail. Why isn't Lord Green in jail? Yeah. 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 Or remove them so they couldn't do any more harm. Because they're all Jesuit. Of countries. Well, I personally think they're probably in the lodge at Goldsmith Street in town or one of the others. The Duke of Westminster, I mean, he's the Grand Master Mason, to be fair. And I mean, he's, that's the Queen's cousin, so that's a privilege, you know. Um, but what I'm bothered about more than anything is if we've never had an inquiry and we don't deal with the child abuse, are we pretending paedophilia stopped? And Harriet, Harriet Harmon. I'm going to say direct to you now. The entire country wants a public apology from you. Yeah. You sit there, you spoiled a 7 7 memorial service because we have to look at your bloody face. And you represented Liberty, who was the paedophile information exchange, and it's on your CV to try and push through the age of consent, family intersexual relationships for the age of four. And you signed them documents and tried to put them through to Parliament. And you're masquerading around in Parliament and you make me physically sick. Yep. <laughs> 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 
Thomas. Go on, Mickey Thomas. I'd like to tell you about what Mark, Mark Sloan identified earlier. Come here. Come here, you fat. <laughs> Mark Sloan told you about the dictatorship of as well. I'll tell you about the dictatorship of right. I exposed, along with Mark and several others, September the 8th last year, the cover-up. Well, we've been beating them non-stop, right? We were, we were meant to get uh, around the table on July the 1st to start a public inquiry in Nottingham. They've stabbed us in the back and started a review. And to silence me, here is a court injunction, right? Yeah. The same court that issued stuff against Tom, issued by a judge, no seal, no signature. My message to you Welcome guys, I am joined with the one and only Jumina Hat. How are you, my friend? I'm all right, Chris. Thank you very much. So uh, I want to discuss the Men in Ishore story. Uh, can you give yeah. me an insight on um, from the beginning, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, poor Meryl, isn't it? Um, it started when she was around the age of three years old. First with a family member. Then she went into foster care. Raped in, as in foster care. And then she eventually ended up in Beechwood Children's Home in Nottingham, where she was oh, raped. At what, at what age was that when she was raped? It started when she was three years old. So she was getting raped at three years old? A family wow. member. A family, a family member. member. Yeah. Yep. So then, uh, so obviously, they, they, she got moved then to, what, Beechwood? It was Beechwood Children's Home in Nottingham. That's where she went. There was three units in uh, Beechwood. And they were called Redcott, Enderley, and Lindens. Melanie was mostly in Lindens. Okay. Lindens is still standing. It was actually sold in December 2013 for five hundred and fifty thousand pounds to a private uh, buyer, a private couple. They actually live in it. Now they know what would have happened in the house. I don't know how anyone could go and live in a house knowing that in every room children were beaten. Children were raped and abused, and it's still standing now. And do you still think it's going on right now as well? In children's homes, one hundred percent. Yeah, I do. Okay, so um, so tell me a bit more about her uh, time in care. Then, what happened from then? Wow. Uh, well, when she was in care, she was actually put on drugs by them. That's her own words, not mine. In letters. She was also put into the sex industry by them. The, it's an absolute disgrace, not just uh, others. She actually believed that children were murdered in there. Now, there hasn't been anybody's found. Anybody's found. But f f what's going on? They're admitting that everything that's happened. I think they should be digging a little bit harder. Of course, but so who, who was the people doing all the raping? But did, because did I read something about? Um, MPs might have been involved. Am I right? Yes, I don't think she she said she wasn't raped by any MPs, but there was children. She said that boys at a weekend would be shipped by bus to London for, for the um, people up there. You know the elite. Yeah, that is one hundred percent. There was a fella actually in the um, in the who worked in the children's home. She was in Linden's, and she said that one of them he's dead now. Thank God. This world doesn't need him. He used to put a Freddy Krueger, Krueger mask on, take the boys into the cellar and rape them. She also says that this man actually took her down there and he raped her as well. Wow. This is in the, he actually working in the children's home. So how, how many years was this going on for, do you know? All told, they've admitted it's gone for 50 years. They've admitted it. It's been in the papers, yeah. national papers, national TV. They've admitted that it's going on. But as I've said before, they've not mentioned one thing, and that is the name of Melanie Shaw. Oh, just... oh, why do you think that is? I think because she just thinks she knows. I've actually got, um, she had a Facebook page, and uh, about 18 months ago, I, I got, um, it, I, I actually saved it. And I believe that her troubles actually actually um, started from this. From this, if you want me to read it, I can read it to you. This is Melanie's words, not mine. Yes, of this course. Is... Right. She wrote, "The police in Nottinghamshire ignored reports constantly for over fifty years. 
about all the Beechwood and other Nottinghamshire children's homes. As we all ran away and reported it to them and all the others, they facilitated and covered it up, including field and residential social workers, child mental health specialists, GPs, teachers. Not one department did anything to protect our children, our country's children in care. They just covered for, they just coveted and protected the paedophiles who also pumped us, this is Melanie Shaw's words, who also pumped us into the child sex trade and gave us drugs to make us addicts and held bogus inquiries. So we're meant to trust you to investigate yourselves, Chief Constable Chris Eyre. You will be held to account. You know I hold an ace card. You just don't know if I'm ever going to use it. You can't lie as it will backfire. Because if you do, I'll play the ace card. It's an ace of hearts too. She's telling them that she's, she knows things big time. So don't start lining the inquiries. If you do, I could play this ace card if and when. But she's telling them it's, it's actually the card of cards. I believe her troubles really started after that. Of course, that is um, some some serious stuff, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's what you call it. She, she even found out that the police were lying. Um, there was a, a social worker gave um, a statement, so she checked it out, and then she came back to the police. When when did you, uh, <coughs> she make this um, statement? Now, let's say for argument's sake, she, they said she made this statement in 2014. Melanie Shaw turned round to them and says. Well, that's funny. I've just found a grave. She died two years earlier. How could she have made that statement? They've booted her doors in. She lost her home. A young son was taken into care. I can name him. The reason is he's over 16 now, definitely. Young Damien. But his name is out there. Anyone could find his name if they looked on you know, Facebook or YouTube. What, what age him. was he taken from her? Do you know? About Roughly. 12. I would say roughly 12 years of age. So he will know everything about her then, wouldn't he? Yeah, he'll well, be a, lot of, a lot of stuff. He'll be over 16 now. He's taken into care. She's also got an older son called Marcus, who actually went over to uh, Thailand for about six months with his wife. His wife calls Marcus's son, wife is called Susanna. And to the best of my knowledge, they have two children, girls. They've kept out of this. And I, I believe he went to, I know she, she went to Thailand because the, scared what they do to their kids she was scared that they go after the grandchildren i don't know where he is now i don't know if he's still in the country he's kept out of it probably too frightened i know of at least i know the name of one of her sisters i'm not going to give it out because i think she was frightened off she was involved for a time but apparently she she they put the frighteners on her so i don't want to give a name out <laughs> Nottingham, we're coming for you. Nottingham City. 
if you're a captain, somebody's got to have advice because the government and the MPs are failing us. It could be your children next. Who are you going to turn to when the secret family courts take your children? It's worth twenty-three billion pounds a year. Family law centres are opening everywhere. It's all lies presented in court. You have no chance. We will not be silenced. We will not be intimidated by the police force of Nottingham or any other police force. But we stand up for the Nottinghamshire victims. The children that are being sexually abused, tortured and beaten in the institutions today. Ongoing child abuse, neglect and sexual abuse of children in our county and city today. The Lord gave me a voice and I will use my voice. It's not a criminal offence to use your voice. I don't harass people, intimidate people. I use the voice that God gave me. They've been abused in the system. The victims are pre prevented from reporting those allegations from the police under the D-list. Put out by Jack Straw. We will not be silent. This is meant to be a dem democracy, Great Britain is. Who's protecting the children of our country? It's not children's services. Who's presiding over the investigation? They're on their third choice now in Goddard. Baroness Butler Schloss wasn't fit for the job. Neither was Fiona Wolf. It's all about protecting the elite. This 67 current MPs under investigation. That's one fifth of Parliament. One fifth of Parliament. There has been mass claims of abuse all substantiating each other. Where are the arrests? We won't be silenced. We won't allow our children in Nottingham to be abused anymore in the care system. They have no voice. They're taking the children of the middle classes. They're taking any child. There's nothing you can do about it. They move the children around the country. They ship them off the brokers. We're in the EU. That is not normal behaviour. And I'm not fighting to use my voice. I'm one of the survivors. And I've had enough. And so the other survivors. Because we're not being listened to by London. What are the victims of child abuse? The other survivors are allowed to have a voice in Parliament. Why aren't we allowed a public inquiry in Nottingham? Why is it an internal review that's being carried out? Another whitewash. We're sick of it. All we want is the children. The families that go for help, they take the children. There's no support for families. They're quick enough to steal the children because of the amount of money involved. I say protect the children of our shire. Stand your hall from presiding over child abuse, it's still happening. This has got to stop. Why doesn't anybody seem to care? What about when it's your child or grandchild and emergency care orders put on your child and the lawyers do nothing? When you're banned from seeing your own child, how are you going to feel? We've had enough operation daybreak into the systematic abuse rate and torture of children spanning Five decades in our county has gone on for four years and it's just a whitewash. We've had enough. We will not be silenced. We will keep standing up. We will suffer persecution and brutality in the hands of the police. To speak out against the perpetrators of child abuse is now an offence in this country. To want justice for the children being abused today. It's classed as an offence. Isn't that our right as a British citizen to stand up against the public elected officials that we are trust to look after us that aren't doing that their job? They're not safeguarding the children. They're complicit in the abuse of our children. Our children are not being safeguarded by our city or council. It was an open secret. Now the whole world knows it's going on worldwide. We care about Nottingham's children. We care about all children in Britain. Why don't the MPs seem to care? Why are they covering their own backs? They don't want to go to jail. 
But I'm afraid it's going to fall like a pack of, a pack of cards. Because we're not going to allow it to go on. We're not, we're not any longer with the corrupt city and county council that covers up systematic child abuse, rape and torture of children in care. 50 years of it, that abuse still goes on today. Children are still being abused, sexually assaulted in the secure mental health institutions which are child prisons. Why doesn't the public want to do anything? Your child could be next. Operation Daybreak is a bogus inquiry that's centred here at this police station. Yeah, yeah. The people in London, they're on their third chair now of the National Child Abuse Inquiry. Whose backs are they covering? Who's frightened to go to prison? 76 MPs have been named now. Multiple allegations. That's one fifth of Parliament. Any decent, rational thinking human being deplores child sexual abuse, he destroys lives. We've had enough, we won't be silent. We've tried to get justice for the survivors. The Minister of Justice is the only one that can sign, sign the form to release her. So she's a, pr a political prisoner, all right? 100% she's a political prisoner, just like Tommy Robinson is. Of course, I, I, I agree. There is going to be, obviously, there will be some negative people out there that will say this is just a conspiracy theory. What do you say to these people that would say that? What I say to them is, if Melanie Shaw was lying, she'd be a free woman today. Yeah. 100%. If she was lying, you'd have now to fear. She's a liar. Give her a little bit of jail time. She'd be out free now. Of course. She's, she's so, been tortured in there. Absolutely tortured. Some of the things that have happened to her, and these are her words, and I've got things wrote down. That lady has been locked up like in solitary confinement. I think she did like 12 months con continuous, getting drugged up. She was getting showers, right? Going to the toilet, for instance. They'd leave the door open. And they'd have three officers watching that lady doing her private things on the toilet. And the odds are they'd have humiliated her. Not just to leave the door open, they'd have been saying things to her. Something else happened to her, and that is Melanie Shaw's words again, not Jimmy the Axe. She'd get a shower, so she'd start naked. Lady on her own, they'd have three officers watching her getting a shower. One of them, she said, and this is her words, was a male. They'd have male prison officer watching her shower, cleaning herself in all her private parts. And it's odds on they'd have been saying dirty things to her to humiliate her. That is torture, mental torture. It's disgusting. And that is Melanie Shaw words, not me making it up. It's in letters. I've seen them. I've got it rolled down somewhere. Well, that is a fact. St. Peter's yeah, Square yeah. in Manchester <laughs> and our awareness day for political prisoner Melanie Shaw. I want to give you a rough-potted life story of Melanie's life. Melanie has always felt that she was a Nottingham girl because she loves Nottingham. But Melanie was born in 1970 in Derby. Melanie was adopted at a very young age and I'm sorry to tell you that she was sexually abused. She was then put with foster carers who sexually abused her again. She had a very rough, difficult childhood. At 15 years of age, Melanie was said to be quite a difficult person to handle and one can understand why. Melanie was then put at 15 into the Beechwood Children's Home in Nottingham and it was there that Melanie has never ever changed her story that not only was she sexually abused but she witnessed the sexual abuse and the torture of many children there and also the murder of a child or children and Melanie Shaw has always insisted that she the ground and show you where that child or children were actually buried. And it's very interesting that eventually Beachwood House was closed down and it was immediately bought by someone on Nottingham Council. They immediately purchased the building and the extensive grounds and very quickly they have the whole lot 
not fenced off with very high fencing and it is thought it was done to stop people getting into the grounds and trying to dig up bodies that were alleged to be there. There is something else I want to say about my talks. Melanie's had a rough life and I promise you in any talk about Melanie I will never swear and I will never blaspheme but on the other hand I am not doing Melanie Shaw or you any favours if I sugarcoat what happened to Melanie. I'm here to tell you the truth and to give you the details which are sometimes very unpleasant. Now, Melanie finally left Beechwood in 1986. She was 16 years of age. She had no upbringing to speak of and not a fabulous education. She had no support whatsoever from social services in Nottingham or anyone. And I, it is not surprising that Melanie fell very quickly with nowhere to live and no money. Melanie fell into a life of drugs and prostitution. I'm Done. sorry, but she did. After a while, Melanie met a much older man with money. He was comfortably off. His name was Derek. He was a good bit older than her and he took care of Melanie very well. They were together for 13 years and they had a son. And that son now is about 20 years of age. I'm not going to identify him, but that is what happened. Well, I was sexually assaulted, Cambridgeshire Police Force are, are actively investigating that sexual assault now. I don't want to discuss any more about it because I do, well I'm hopeful that it will be dealt with correctly. Um, it, was abs it, it, was, it was the worst of the worst what you could imagine. To, to be spe set, kept on solitary confinement, even the girls in the prison were saying we need to get you back over to the main side Melanie. You know, that this is ridiculous. And I've got the Cambridgeshire Police Force, they've threatened me, they've been on the phone. We're, we're going to come and arrest you, Melanie, we're going to get you. Wherever you are in the country, we are going to bring you back to Peterborough. You've committed a crime. I, I said, pardon? Oh, suspicion of committing a crime. Now, I don't know if the plan, I mean, it's harassment that they're saying. Now, I didn't think it was a crime myself to stand on a pavement, ask visitors if they wanted to be filmed. Of, of the people you're visiting, how are they in the prison? Have they complained of any human rights abuses in, in any way? Uh, have you found it difficult when you're visiting your friends and your loved ones in prison? I filmed some of the staff. Uh, I didn't actually... I didn't interview anybody that, or question any members of staff that had abused me. But um, they called the police out then, when, when, and the police officer was nice. He gave me the number to the pizza firm, I rang a pizza and I carried on filming. Um, they told me, you, you can't film here, we own the pavements. I said, I don't think you do, the council do. We own the road as well. I said, well, I believe that's another highway agency. You can't put your tent there. And, and in, in the end, I went back a second time, they, three police officers came out then, a wagon and, and a police officer on a bike again. They said now, um, they have said it's entrapment and something else. I said, what are you talking about? And the police officers left, they was okay. But I then started to get male members of staff, ones that have been particularly bad to me in the prison, coming into my face, all this is recorded outside the prison on, on the main security tape, so I'm looking forward to, well I'm not looking forward to it, I've got no choice, they're going to arrest me anyway, they've made that perfectly clear, but everything is recorded on the main CCTV in the surrounding areas of the prison, so, you know, they're in my face and they're telling me, get away from here, move from there, I'm saying, no, you can't make me move. Why are you in my face? You know, you know you've been bending me up, assaulting me and abusing me. 
Now you find yourself in a different situation. You feel, I don't know what you feel, I can't speak for any of them officers, but the ones that committed abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, that they shouldn't have done it, I think they, 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 they feel, um, I think they feel nervous, to be honest, because, uh, you know, A, that they've been, uh, well, bar three months, the last 12 months I've been spent in prison, I've been suffering abuse, now they find themselves dealing with me as the member of the public, and they're saying it's harassment, right, I, I, I th you know, and they can't assault me. They can't hit me. They can't frighten me. They, 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 they can't do them evil things towards me. And they don't know how to behave now. Just want to ask this question, which is on a lot of people's lips, actually. Um, what did you witness in Beechwood that makes, you, makes um, the authorities so determined to silence you? Right. I've said this in my police interview, I did a three days video interviewing and I don't know charges get back against anybody that assaulted me. Well, the, the serial killer, Mark Lucia Griffiths, seeing him, the, the boss of the compound, he's still under investigation, he's about 90 now, he, he ran it from the 1960s all the way until 88. When I survived murder, He he said he used to rape the children, but as he got older, he 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 got Mark Lucia Griffiths in because they was the worst scum of the scum in the children's homes. What did they do? Pardon? What what did they do? Why were they the worst? Um, because we was the children. The children locked in the secure homes in the child psychiatric wards today, still now, are the children that are sick and tired of being molested, physically abused, and you put up a fight against it. You're just not going to tolerate it. You're, you're a pervert. Get your fucking hands off me. Sorry for swearing. I said I wouldn't swear. But if you fight back, if you object to pay... they. A, a residential social worker is like a foster parent, but you're in a, in a, in, in a building together, you're not, you're not in a home. And when you're being maltreated, if you put up a fight against it, if you're not passive, you get it worse. Okay. You get it worse. And I was held hostage for an hour under the giant rhododendron bush with a leather belt round my throat, forced to carry out a sex act on Mark Lucia Griffiths. I'd already been raped at that point because I was shutting my mouth off. He, he um, when I was gardening, I've been gardening that day, doing the cleaning, like the, um, the uh, near the perimeter fence at Beechwood. It was like um, crazy paving, brickwork, and I was with Bob the gardener, and um, Mark's out at the back of Lyndon's, and he. He says, oh, you're doing a good job, and I forgot, you know, well, what, what are you doing? How long are you working on it? I thought, I don't want to talk to you. You've, you've raped me in the basement, this, you know. I said, don't be scared, I'm not going to hurt you. Look, I'm in the middle of the grass. And I, I, I tried to put him off, but, it, but he wasn't having it. And he says, look, I can't hurt you. The, the Lyndon's living room windows there, all the staff's in there. And I got about three metres from him, and he lunged at me. He'd got the leather belt in both hands behind his back. He moved it round, hooked it over my neck and dragged me into a bush, that's how it started off, and then it was twisted around my neck. Um, but you survived that? Well, well he, he said, you've been shooting your mouth off. He says, there's been other fuck others like you, the most intelligent ones, they, they, you know, I prefer the younger boys, they put up and shut up. He says, I've had problems before and I've had to kill them, you need to keep your fucking mouth shut or I'm going to kill you. And I said, don't be stupid, you can't just kill a kid in care. How are you going to get away with it? They're going to be reported missing. You can't do that. I said, prove it. This is after, uh, he's had the bolt around my neck for, for a bit, and he makes me, I, I give him, I'm forced to give him oral sex. And then he's, he's saying about, keep it shut or I'll kill you like the others. And I'm saying, prove it. That was the biggest mistake in my life saying prove it. He moved me then from the back where the car park is round to the giant rhododendron bush so nobody could see and then for an hour and he was a great big guy 
bodybuilder had got his own private gym in, in Lyndon's basement and this is in the 80s but this running machines everything had spent a fortune that was his place that's where he did all, 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 all the sex offences and the buggery um, he went, he says, prove it. He says, I'll prove it. Then he said, I've I wanted to get this off my chest for 10 years and I can't tell anybody. And he went into detail about two children that he'd murdered. Uh, the boss had covered up for him. He, he said that the boy that he murdered, he left the body there. No, sorry. He put the body in the boot of the car. He put the body in the boot of the car. Right, and DVLA will have records because he torched that car anyway, so there'll be records that that car was, you know, in, you know written off by fire. He said, and for the next two nights, and I mean, he's 20 stone of hulking muscle, got a rib case that pops out, he's a huge gym freak, um, and we're all emaciated kids anyway. I put a photo on Facebook of me, Norma smuggled that camera onto Beechwood site, which was illegal, um, and my doctor says, you, you look like an 11 year old from a concentration camp, you know, what your bones are like. And uh, he said, the thing is, he goes, I'm a big guy, and he's sobbing like a baby. He goes, I'm a big guy. He says, but it's on clay. It's built on clay. And for the next two nights, after I finished at 10 o'clock, I spent all night digging the clay. Now, I went up there trying to excavate with a film crew, and we struggled to get through the clay. It, 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 to dig low enough, it took him two days, but the body's in the back of the car, and it's summer. He says, do you know how much fluid comes out of a dead body? And I mean, I've got a bolt round my neck. And he's already mentioned about and now he's confessing about these murders. And he says, I'm having to move the car every half an hour because of the smell. I don't want attention being drawn to the car. And he says, it took two days. He says, and I've got the body, the child's body wrapped in tarpaulin. He says, there's fluid, body fluid all over the boot of the car. The car stinks. He says, eventually I drag it, the body, bury it, cover it in the clay, because the clay goes blue after a bit as you're digging down. But there's foxes there. There's a lot of foxes. I used to look after the ducks. There nine of the ducks one night. I lost £2.50 pocket money for that. I forgot to put them away. Um, and then there's this cast iron metal thing. He got it from... Um, Oh, can't know. There was a merchant up there, and he says I struggled to lift the fucking thing. It weighed a ton, and he goes, "I'm a strong guy, but I had to put that there to weight the body down so the foxes didn't drag the body out." He says, and it's also a mark. And now that was still there. That was still there even after the police had allegedly been up on the site. The second murder. Oh, he says, and then he says, I tried bleaching the car and everything. I couldn't get the smell of, of, of de death out of the car, so I had to set fire to it. I was without a car. He says, because I have to take social workers in the car, children and stuff. He says, so I, I set fire to the car and I, and I was without a car, which was a bit of a pain. Then he says, the other murder. That is the one that he left the body in under the giant rhododendron bush. Right, he finished shift, at the, the child reported missing, he killed the kid in the afternoon, he kept all the staff in the building. The police came out, I think it was a C-52. When was this, roughly? Right, well this one went under the under the football pitch, multi-surface football pitch, and this child, it what was the night though? before the final surface was laid. That's all I know, that's the day that child was murdered. Because he said they helped before, he says they'll never find that one. He left the body in, in, uh, under the rhododendron bush. The police, he hid the body there, made sure no staff came back, went back into Lindens to carry on working. The police came, the child reported missing. Then he finishes shift at, at 10 o'clock, leaves Beechwood, comes back an hour later, he says, parks up, turns the light out, and the police car's still there. So he waits for the police to leave. Then, because all the hardcore's been put down, because they're doing a multi-surface football pitch at the back of Lindens for the boys, he, he drags the corpse, he tells the night lady not to let any children out of the fucking bedroom and, and tells her to keep away from the window. He drags the body because it's, it's just to the left hand side of Lyndon's. That's not been demolished. So you saw this? No, this is what he's telling this me, crying his eyes out. Right, sorry. Right, he drags it to the back. He says, what I did, Mel, is 
I just kicked some of that, moved some of the old core out of the way, put the body in the corner. I didn't put it in the middle of the of the of the area because I didn't want them walking over it or to come across it. I thought it's less liable to be disturbed up against the fence in the corner. Covered it with hardcore. The following day, they laid the final surface of the fine final layer of the multi-surface football pitch. He says, and I stood at the window all day looking out the bay window as they did it, think, yeah, all day long. He said, I've got staff moaning because I'm doing no work. And um, he says, they'll never find that one. He says, in fact, they, 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 they help me bury it, really. He says, and they give me two to three kids a week to rape, you know. And then he went into panic then. Oh, my God. Fucking hell. I could go to prison for... I mean, he did end up in jail, a convicted child sex rapist in the kids' homes. Um, Is he still at large? He died. He died. It was it August last year? But anyway, he uh, he he then goes into panic. Oh my God! I could get life in murder because you. I'm gonna have to kill you. How am I gonna kill you? Uh, if I stab you, there'll be blood everywhere. Uh, I, um, I'll I'll have to strangle you. Um, fucking hell, what am I going to do? I'll deal with that later. And the man is, I, I've, I've got a belt round my neck and this great big man that, that, that's a control freak that's raping us all, just confessed to murder, is now discussing openly, talking out loud, how he's going to fucking kill me. And I thought, fucking hell, it's right. Why didn't you keep your gob shut? You survived a murder at four mil. You, you're just bringing all this on your bloody self. I thought, this is it. This permanent pitch blackness coming now. I'm, I'm dead. Whatever them other kids fucking went through before that death thing comes where you, it's just pitch black or whatever it is, I'm about to get this now. Mm. So he decided on the back wall, he says, right, you're going to walk as quickly as possible. He says, if you can put up any struggle, I'm going to twist the bolt around your neck and you, it'll cut off your wind supply and you, you're going to go passive. And at the time when I had to carry out the sex act before he con confessed about the murders, I managed to get my hand down just to loosen it a bit off my throat so I could breathe. And... It goes to march me, and I can see where the wall is. I thought, fuck's sake, man, I'm going to be dead now, because he's so bloody big. So how did you escape? Well, I didn't know Bob the gardener had been searching for me for an hour. It's, it's over a five-acre complex. This building's littered everywhere. This is Beechwood. Yeah, and oh, fucking hell, God must have been looking out after me. But the gap between the school and Redcott building must be... Three metres, two metres, and he starts to march me and Bob walks past. I've been held hostage under a tree, an enclosed bush, ginormous bush. He's been, he could have been anywhere on Beechwood grounds looking for me. He's been searching for over an hour. And I saw him and I thought, fucking hell. He shouldn't have been there. That was a ten second window of opportunity. The, 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 the chance of that is so slight. You know, and he drops the belt from around my throat, and he goes, "No, I hear to me mumbles because he's behind my back. He's got a knife at my back, and he's like forcing me forward to war. I'm dead thin." And he says, "What the fuck is he doing there? Don't say a bloody word." And he drops the belt from around my neck. So I goes, "Bob, sir, sir, please help me, sir, because I've been working with Bob all week. You know, I was, a, I wasn't." Well, I was all right, you know. Please help me. He's he's held me hostage. He's raped us all, and he's murdered them. And I said, please. He's got a knife at me back. Please, can I run to you, Bob? And he says, yeah. And I run to him, and I clinged up to him. I'm like sixteen at this point. And um, and I say, sir, please request. He he, he emptied uh, his pocket. He's put the knife in his pocket, and for about ten, fifteen seconds, Bob doesn't say anything. And then he looks at him, and he says. I've worked here for over 12 years, I've heard the rumours. Please be God, it not be true. And he walked up to him, grabbed him by the throat, put the blade at his throat. He says, yeah, it is fucking true, old man. And at that point, Bob just started to sob. He goes, oh my God, them poor children have been abused. I start to scream. Fat Pat the Cook comes out. It's staff meeting day, so every member of Redcott staff's on duty. The kids are still in school. That saved me as well because everybody heard it. Hello, guys. So, Chris here. I'm talking. I'm joined with Glenn Safa and Martin. Um, so, the 14th of September. Would you like to explain about this, please, mate? Yeah, on the 14th of September, um, we are going to Ranton Hospital starting at 5 30. 
The reason why we picked five thirty was because the visiting time is from two till four. Okay, so obviously that will interrupt with visitors. We don't want to interrupt anyone. We want a peaceful demonstration. You know, we have got balloons um, do uh, not donated that people might have to buy on the day, cheap. We've got, um, it's a display of fireworks display. The reason why we're doing this, uh, through Men in the Shore, Men in the Shore has had no contact with anybody whatsoever. She feels like she's been left dumped in the, and no one loves her. She has cried out for help. Now, through Jimmy the Hat, I've been contacting Raceley for the last two weeks, but I've been studying Men in the Shore for the last six, seven months on her case. You know, I haven't been to Leeds on it, but I keep looking at this and thinking, you're doing demos in Manchester. You're doing demos around other places, but not getting enough people coming out. But as it's ranting, I feel like that is the place where she is. We've got to go where she is, so she can listen to us. And it's gonna be a great day. Um, we've contacted Rampton. We're waiting for Rampton to come back and ask him where we're going. Can now, they refuse? Um, they can refuse because it's on private ground. But I've got something in line, which I'm not going to say on, um, on camera at this present moment, that we will be in the building. That's good. We will get in the building, or whatever happens, this demonstration is not going to be stopped. It's going there. Tommy Robinson spoke to me personally and said, Glenn, please go for it. I am supporting Melanie Shaw. So the team are supporting Melanie Shaw in All this Tommy's team are supporting Melanie Shaw. So Tommy's supporters will support Melanie Shaw. I know they do. Because if you looked outside the Old Bailey, what you done, Chris, you done that film on You Never Walk Alone, and you put Tommy on stage, and he's holding the Melanie Shaw banner saying free Melanie Shaw. And did you hear the crowd of thousands in the thousands crowd? Thousands there, weren't there? Singing free Melanie Shaw. So uh, what's the importance of people actually being there? Because we, we, we want to try and get the numbers up. So for the people that are unsure about should we go or should we not go, um, explain to these people why it's so important yeah, it's, to be there. Be, well, it's important uh, on many aspects, but uh, we, we've got to get the message over and we've got to bring attention to why, she, why is she in Rampton, for God's sake? It's the, it's the most renowned mental hospital in the whole nation. Why is she at the top mental institution, you know? Uh, she's got, she's, we know what she's gonna expose when she does come out. But while they've got her drugged up the way she is and uh, kept isolated, she's got no chance of rehabilitation, especially with a section 41 on her. You know, uh, that, that can give her up to five more years inside there. No, uh, right then. Her mental of health is decreasing. Do you know, like, yeah. just answer to any negative people out there as well, well, she is, like, she probably is mental, that's what she's doing in there. Can you, can you answer to these people that might say these kind of things? Uh, unless you've been abused yourself from a very early age and you've lived a life that's involved a lot of other people that have been abused and abusers, you, you wouldn't know, it's, it's a quagmire, you know. You got to think, a hard life. you got to think, she, with her family. she got abused at a very young age yeah. by her family. So if anyone knows about abuse, and abuse yeah. they will know what we're talking about. I, to, I've never been abused, so I'm on a different scale than anyone else. But me looking at her, going through her head and thinking all the time, she got abused. So the social service has done their job properly and got her away and put her into a care home, Beechwood. Beechcroft, sorry. Yeah. And she got abused in there. She comes out, bless her up. Everyone's saying on there, oh, she's on heroin, she's a druggie. You go through what she went through. There's only two people you can go to. You can go to help or you can have help on drugs. She went down the wrong system of took drugs. That's nothing it doesn't necessarily with. mean you're a bad person if you just go to, you're right. go to drugs. Not not That's not right. That's right. So she thought that is going to help her where the social services have been helping her, not drugs helping her. Of course, because when you're taking drugs, it's a, it's a way of getting out of that um, yeah. mindset, isn't it? It's just escaping from reality. Yeah, and she's people. gone, and they've set the Beechcroft, she's highlighted Beechcroft, she knows there's murders gone on there, she knows she's coming yeah. out. She knows she knows, not, she knows too much about it, too much. And the government and the establishment are frightened to let her out because she will, whistleblow and whistleblow 
How many whistleblowers have we got out there? Hundreds of whistleblowers now. Hundreds. We need them all together. We need, we need as many people as we can to come out of this because it's a question of social justice. So if there's any other people that uh, know of something similar going on, uh, come along. Show your support. Have there been to any of our, our court appearances at all? Everyone at Leeds. She only brought, she only brought once. They brought her hours late. They brought her in the court. She was off her head. I don't know what they'd done to her, but whatever they did to her, they drove her mental. They let him, they let her go on for 10 minutes and then they just gripped her and dragged her out the back door. It was, I, after 60 seconds, I, went, I had tears in my eyes. In my head, I went, mission complete, just release her. You've destroyed the woman. I couldn't believe it. Now, because I've not gone by the thing, just give me a second, I'll tell you something. No worries. And, and the dates. Yep. On the 2nd of August, 2018, a professor, Jennifer Shaw, passed Melanie Shaw, passed Melanie Shaw fit for trial. In other words, I'm a professor, I've done my eight years training, I know what I'm talking about. That woman can stand trial, she's fit. Uh, that was on the 2nd. Five days later, on the 7th of August, 2018, they brought her into court, absolutely puddled, absolutely mental. What did they do to that woman in five, in five, just five days? In five days from having a professor pass a fit for trial, five days later, you'd go, please, just release her. Even if you believed her, which I do, you would not convict anybody on the way they had her. And yet five days earlier, on the 2nd of August, a professor passed a fit for trial. So something happened in them five days. And whatever of course. They did, they Do you think it was uh, to stop her saying certain stuff in a <coughs> courtroom? Without a doubt. I think they wanted us all to see her. Look at her, what are you defending this girl for? She's mad as a bat. The things she was saying, wasn't her fault. Have you got any examples that you can tell us? Yeah, they have. She said to the judge... Judge, I will marry her, but I will not have sex with her. I was the leader of the Conservative Party. I was the deputy leader of the Labour Party. I am a prison officer, as you can see, with my uniform. It was t I was crying. 60 seconds yeah. before he even heard that, I was crying. I knew they drove her mad. So how did a professor, that Professor Jennifer Shaw, only five days early from what we were watching, pass a fit for trial. What they did in them five days to, it, to that poor woman, I'll never know. Absolutely disgusting. They'd gone from the professor saying she's fit for trial to absolutely off her head. I was crying my eyes out, just release her. They let her show herself up. They let her us see what they wanted us to see. And then they just dragged her out the back, gripped hold of her, dragged her out. <sighs> That is bad. bad. The only um, time they I've... brought her. The only time they brought her. Never brought her. And a, a, a barrister. I was a better barrister than him. He's so bad, he was fixed. Apparently, he's in a lot of trouble anyway. One time, he didn't even turn up. And I went in the court and said, he won't be coming. He's under investigation. I know that because my mate, Benny, has got him under investigation. Apparently, he, he's got a criminal record. Or he's bought off. For instance, you'd get the um, pros prosecution witness. And he'd say to him, so you've got evidence that she set fire to, uh, she set fire to, yes. You've got it on video, have you? I've got it on video, yes, that the fires that started. Now, anyone, we're going like, ask him to see it. You've got now to lose. Let's see the evidence. Uh, Paris just went, all right, thank you. Sat him down, brought the next one on. Same thing. Yep, we thought we've got video. I videoed her with the fire. Now, instead of going, which anyone would do, can I see the evidence? He never, he just went, all right, thank you. Taking him at his word. The prosecution witnesses, and he's letting them give evidence. They could have said, did Melanie Shaw really hit someone with an hammer? Yes, I see it with the hammer. Instead of saying, you got evidence, have you got it on camera? Yeah, oh, that's all right. You'd have to see it. Show yeah. the evidence. So that was not ask. shown. The evidence no. was not shown. Didn't even ask for it. Didn't even ask for it. Every time but, the Ur barrister stood up to talk, the, 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 the prosecution would sit down smiling. Every time they come out of that court, and I went to every one of them, they were out smiling. That's a prosecution. It was a doddle. 
No one That's shocking. That. It's disgusting. There's letters lately coming out. I've just put one on today. And what she's saying, don't give up. If you read, it's there. It's, it's on Justice for Million Show Real People. I've put it on a page on, on Telegram. Three million short chat, is it called? Yeah. It's on there, and you'll see where she's saying, keep it going. I've got I've got a road to me. Uh, it is a piece of a, a letter that she wrote to me. I want to re atteriate until I'm released in the flesh. I'm being held here, and I'm very unhappy. Big thanks for fighting for me and spreading the word. Please don't quit. She's begging me not to quit. Respect and thanks from Melanie. She's asking me not to quit. She's saying until she walks free out in the flesh, do not quit. And she yeah, knows that'll get her in trouble. She knows it'll get in trouble, but she's prepared to take it. She said they will in letters to me, she said they will not buy me off. She knows about this inquiry in Nottingham, they never let her go to. She said fifty percent of what they said is true and fifty percent are absolute baloney. These lies. She won't take bribes. She's gone through too much. It's a disgrace what they've done to her. I'm just thankful that now her name's really getting out there because she needs our backing, as do other people who don't even know their names. So when we're backing Melanie Shaw, we're doing this also for the other whistleblowers that get sh they usually end up in prison or in the lunatic asylum or even Exactly. Dead. We don't know about everyone else, do we? we? We don't. We're doing it for them as well. You're not forgot. We're doing it. Someone's got to be at front, and it happens to be Melanie Shaw. Of course, I agree. If, if, if you look... You've got uh, Samantha <coughs> Morton. She's a big film star. About three years ago, she put it on YouTube, and it's still there to this day. I have shared it, so I can't. I'm not. She, if she didn't want it out, she would have took it down. And there she is saying, "I'm a big star. I was interfered with and abused in Nottinghamshire children's homes." One of the older lads, they took us ice skating, it was short, so they took us to Burnstone Park, next to where Shield Lodge Police Headquarters is, and they bought us all off a lager and saved the receipt for the petty cash. They said, if you've got any more money, you can buy another drink. Some of the lads were in there remanded for drug dealing, so there's cannabis being smoked. I'd never touched it before. Some of them bought extra pints. We're on the mini boss, Mark's there. One of the big lads, he's got a claim in, I forget his name, but he shouts, Mark's a seller rapist, and Mark turned around, face like, shut the fuck, threatening like. They caught him, they put him on the floor and he fucking virtually stamped him to death. Kieran and another member of staff, Norma, says it's a direct order. Get him off, he's going to kill him. Marks is unconscious on the floor. And um, I, I went upstairs and just held the poor kid because he was still normal. He wasn't a lunatic child. And I just said, I love you and I care about you, Marcus. Well, Melanie... I know this is difficult for you to he talk left, about. He left and then he came back five months later and I was excited thinking he was coming back but he started stealing cars. His first thing he said was, come on lads, let's go out fucking pinching cars and get pissed. And I said, Marcus, you've changed. And he'd had to become like that because of what he was getting. You've reported this to the police, haven't you? In Nottinghamshire Police. What's happened? Tell us there. What's been? What have the police been I, doing? I'll tell you what I what I believe is happening. We're going to have a, we're going to have a token a token court case. We're going to put a couple up for rape, raping girls, not buggery, nothing else. We're going to have an internal inquiry, and then we're going to say, well, we've we've dealt with it. What about? All the senior management, the police officers, at the time there was one little boy ran off and he, he managed to escape. You'd, you'd be A for six, six weeks or something because if there was a trip to the swimming baths that was your chance to escape. You know, even though it wasn't a secure unit, they sat on the doors and beat you up if you tried to go. Um, so, so, the, so Operation Daybreak then, is the, that's been going on since 2011, supposedly investigating abuse at Nottinghamshire homes, that, including the ones you've been that's describing. That's another, that, that's another one, is there's Daybreak into each one, and then there's an, another name um, for the other homes. So. Right, okay. So, um, is there any point in these investigations then, or what, what well, do you think should be, be happening? There should be an investigation, mm. people should be held criminally responsible. 
But that doesn't seem to happen, does it? No. So why do you think paedophiles and paedophile rings are receiving so much state protection? I mean, it's quite obvious that they are being protected, isn't it? I think if you're just a member of the public and you're not a member of the elite and you abuse a child, they'll, put you, they'll, they'll sentence you at court and put you in prison. It makes, you, makes them look like we're anti-paedophile. But if you're a paedophile and you're a mason, or you're very, very well fit, or you, you've got a lot of um, influence. It's, it's as if you, you've got um, permission to do what you want. Just like diplomatic community. There's a recent case in the national media where the son of a foreign diplomat, he went to a nightclub, he picked up a very pretty girl, raped her, slashed her throat, murdered her, he got arrested, and he just told a copper, it's diplomatic community, my father, my father is a foreign diplomat, you will have to release me. And the police said we felt sick, but we had to police the guy. Well, it, it, it's, it's the power structure, certain people are protected. So, what in your opinion needs to happen now to get justice for victims and survivors like yourself? There isn't going to be any justice. I mean, oh God, sometimes I laugh, sometimes I smile because I can't believe when you see it first hand. It's still going on. Let's pre not pretend it's stopped because there is young offenders in HMP Peterborough. They're 18 years of age, 19 years of age. They've been in care and been abused. So it's still going on. It's not just historic because they like to use the term historic if, abuse. If, don't it they? If, 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 if it happened yesterday, it's historic because yesterday's history, that's gone. Right. Do you think it's happening? Because whoever has put a timeline on the word historical. There's not. Okay. So, um, what do you hope speaking out like this will achieve? In the back of my mind, I don't believe it's going to achieve anything really, but I'm trying to protect myself now. I'm trying to let people who have not, not seen it that, that think the local authority are good people, you know, to wake people up. I also want to protect myself now because I do have a fear I'm going to be found dead and I, and I really want to emphasize that. I've got a feeling that I'm either going to be found suicided in prison or drug overdose, but I mean I don't take drugs, no class A drugs, I mean I'm getting fat, you know, I don't take drugs and that. But if you want to murder me, you've tried twice now for speaking out about stuff because it was for speaking out when I was four that I survived the drowning. Thank you for speaking to us um, about your experiences and sharing your views. Um, we're really grateful. I know it hasn't been easy and just want to say wish you all the best. Well, I just want to say I've got four different police forces after me now. Devon and Cornwall, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire and now Cambridge. And they've, they've told me they're going to come and nick me and they're dragging me back to Peterborough now. If I end up back in jail, all I want to say is, and to reiterate this, my life, and you can ask my MP Chris Leslie this, because I was working with him for a couple of years before I whistle blew, and I had no problems putting put questions to him at restaurants, you know, at, at MP question times and stuff, and working with the power charity with Councillor Susan Johnson, Labour St Anne's Ward, Sue Johnson, and I was working at the school, my son's school, doing all the flowers, I work with Alain International, I work with the POW charity, uh, Finnish Planting Hospital for the Princess Trust, I was doing painting and decorating and stuff, giving advice to other people, everything, other, other clients, that was having the children stolen, to be, to be honest, ex-care kids. I did have an ad, um, I, and I had not been in trouble for 14 years, yes I've been in trouble after I'd left care, but... What was that for? Numerous things, right? But for 14 years, life had been fine. I've been foreign holidays, looking after Damien. I'd never had my children removed. I've been a full-time mum for 24 years. And, and everything has gone to pot. Everything has gone to pot. So... Since? Since I spoke out about daybreak. At the time, Norma says, I mean, Rigby took me and he says, you can speak out when I'm dead. He says, you've won the golden ticket. I said, the golden ticket? I've just survived murder. I 
I told him I'd come back and get him. And what makes me so angry was what was allowed to happen, what's still going on today is happening, but personally for me and all the other Beechwood victims, because we've got Beechwood syndrome, that's what I call it, but it's the cover-up, that's the worst bit. Bad enough what they did to us, bad enough the damage and the impact it had on our lives, bad enough that there was a conspiracy and it was allowed to go off, the police knew, all departments knew, and as far away as Leicester knew. A lot of them people are dead or whatever, right, they're going to get away with it. But who are the corrupt ones now dealing with this investigation, alleged investigation, protecting people, because this was happening non-stop for 25 years. It wasn't a discreet 11-month period when I'm there. So from what period are we talking about? From, from the 1960s up till 2000. Okay. It's all these children's homes, and it's... But, and if it's happening in Foster, it's so, mainly the institutions, I believe Amadel to still be open, they didn't want to make that even public about that place, and, it, and, and in the children, ch the children's psychiatric wards at Nottingham, under CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, it's happening everywhere. I don't, it, it's there, it's in your face, it's in your face. When, when, why do you th what do you think the prisons are full of? Victims of institutional sexual abuse. The majority of women in prison, because I worked my way through it, I didn't have problems with the women in there. The women didn't have problems with me in there because they knew exactly where I was coming from. So it's full of um, abuse victims yeah. from the care system. Yeah. Then. And they're putting in them in there on, on what grounds? Well, usually what happens is, and, and I, I was injecting heroin for 20 years, you see, it, it, by the age of 20, I thought, I can't cope with what I know on the world. I've never used a computer till three years ago. I thought it was just beach when it happened at. The local authority didn't like it when I started researching. They said, oh, it's going to make you poorly. I said, no, we're not alone. This has happened all over the place. Our lawyers representing the Brunest in Bryn Allen in Wales and all that. It's happened all over the bloody country. We was all drugged in the children's. I'm, I'm lucky. My, my doctor says I'm very lucky, Anna, because I've been on Valium since... Not regular until the last five years. I'm getting no medication now. Um, I'm moving around hotels. I'm moving around places. I'm going to go back to Nottingham. I'm ready, you know? What are you expecting to happen there? I don't really want to be on my own because they're going to beat me up in the house. If somebody's there to film it, I've got less chance of being beat up by the police. But... I don't know. I'll have to be passive. If if I question anything, they'll get aggressive. That's what they do, and they'll say it's a restraint technique. And I'll end up with all burns on my arms and blood and stuff like last time when they got me in the house. Um, they know my face, so they'll come and arrest me, take me to Peterborough. I've already been told this is going to happen by the Cambridgeshire Police Force, and then I <laughs> I've done nothing wrong. But I hope I don't get took back to jail. Because so. if they put me in jail, they can do what they want again to me and there's nothing I can do about it. Thank you for watching the story of Melanie Shaw. You can also catch the full interview of me, Glenn and Marty on my channel. And um, the interview with Jimmy and Hat will also soon to be uploaded. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share everywhere. Please leave a like and a comment. Um, 14th September, Rampton Hospital, 5.30pm. Please turn up and uh, show your utmost support for Melanie Shaw. Thank you. When the night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand Stand by me so darling, darling, stand by me Oh, stand by me Oh, stand, stand
Just as long as you stand 